Well, happy Sunday to you today. It is a good place to be. I tell you what, I'm so excited you are here with us. We are really, it's just Vision Sunday. This is the Sunday we really just navigate the ministry year and launch into this year together where we realign and reconnect to the heart of God for our church. And uh, we're just refocusing a lot of things that can take our focus, um, but we are in it together and uh, just excited for what God is doing at the harbor before we just get into that, I want to just take a moment, as we always do, and welcome those who are online. We're so thankful that you connect with us for wherever you are, and uh, as well as, as good as it may be there, it is better in the room, and we are committed to making room for you, so much so that we are now in two services. Come on now. And, uh, and there's, room, there's room for you. There's room for you. We want to meet you. And maybe you're here today. And you're here. Maybe you took the, you, you accepted the invitation to join us in the room and you're back maybe for the first time or first time in a long time. We're so happy you're here with us. Come on, let's just welcome everybody. Let's do that. I know. Church is just not the same without you, you know. It's just urch. It's just sh- urch. I didn't test that run in the first service. Should have tested that. Dry run that, baby. Anyway, we're happy you're here. Uh, we're vision series, vision. You ever heard the pastor used to say vision leaks, and uh, it's like a hole in your bucket, and you can you be filled at one point, you have clarity, and all of a sudden it just leaks out, and you wonder what happened. And I think vision, it's a good part, it's a reminder for us, they're like, what is, what is the most important things? There are a lot of things in life that are important. We know that. It's, there's a lot of important things we need to do with, but there's also something that's the most important. And when it comes to vision, when it comes to vision for our life, not just for the church, but even for our lives, we have to discover what is the most important thing that we need to commit our lives to. Scripture has a lot to say about vision. In Proverbs it says, where there is no vision, that people actually perish. That vision is something that actually drives us and gives us life. Maybe you've been in seasons of your life where you didn't have a vision for your life. I remember going through a season where I was without work, and I didn't have a job. And the first couple days were great. You know, I just slept in, I drank like 18 cups of coffee and just really didn't do a whole lot. But by day three or four, you start like feeling this like angst, like what, what am I getting up to do? What am I getting up for? And I just realized that really quickly something started to die inside of me that I just sort of lost hope and I came to a purpose list. And I can see how without a vision for your life, you can perish. The NIV says where there is no revelation, the people that just cast off restraint, you know, you just become apathetic. You don't even care that you don't care. You don't have a purpose for your life. It's sort of like a, a ship without a rudder. You know, you're in the sea, but you're not really doing much. You're just sort of going where life takes you. I love how the message version says, when people can't see what God is doing, so that's the revelation we're talking about. We can't see what God is doing. They stumble all over themselves. They just trip up over themselves, and they you don't know where they are going. So what is Scripture saying? Us, vision is important. Vision creates clarity, and clarity, as discovered, creates confidence. Vision creates clarity, and clarity creates confidence where we know what we are called to do. We know our objectives in which we are living our life for. It's been said that based, you know, that when it's discovered, hey, what's the important thing, or what must I do today? I heard a preacher say, based on my past experiences, my present circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams then what's the wisest thing to do? Well, it's hard to make that decision if you don't have a vision for your life. You know, we can look back, we can see where we are, but unless we know where we're going, it's hard to know what to do. And so vision isn't just sort of a a nice-to-have thing. We're discovering in scriptures, vision is sort of a need-to-have thing. We need vision for our life in order to live the life that God has for us. And so how do we get this clarity? How do we get this confidence. Well, it tells us in Psalm, Psalm 16, it says, you, God, show me the way or the path of life. You show me the way and the path of life. Fast forward to New Testament, Jesus comes into the scene, and he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So we, as a New Testament church, get to see Jesus. But the psalmist says, you, God, are the, you show me the path of life, grant me joy in your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever, that there is something connected to purpose, our purpose that is connected to living for God, living and walking in the path that he has created for us. And so our mission as a church is to lead people into this growing and overflowing relationship 
where Jesus, where you would overflow with joy, hope, and peace that comes through this growing and thriving relationship with Jesus. Here's what I've discovered, is that the closer I get to Jesus, the clearer the pathway becomes. Because I know a lot of us are like, well, I don't know what path to take. I don't know where God's calling me. I don't have a vision for my life. Listen, the closer you get to Jesus, the clearer the pathway becomes comes, the scripture says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that there's a, a closeness that he is calling us to, invites us into, in order to get clarity, to get confidence, to get a vision for our life. And so we've created a pathway at the church to help you get closer to Jesus. We have been doing the same thing for the last three years. We're going to continue to do the same thing for the next 30 years. As we continue to follow faithfully after Jesus, we believe that if you follow this pathway, it will lead you closer to Jesus and you will gain clarity for your life and vision for your life. The first step, if you haven't done it, you're in it already. We want you to experience life. We want you to experience life. This is what we do with our, our weekend gatherings, our Sunday gatherings. We want you to come to experience life. Not only do we want you to experience life, like the life-giving hope that Jesus gives us, life-giving life, but Jesus is, says he is the way, the truth, and the life. We want you to experience Jesus. We want you to get closer to Jesus through our gatherings. And just as you get, as you get closer to him, you get more confidence and clarity in him. So we want you to invite you to this place where you can experience life on Sundays. But Sundays isn't enough. You know, Sunday faith isn't enough faith. We need you to take the next step where you begin to live in community, where you welcome people into your life. Jesus gives us, the, the Spirit of God saves us, but he gives us people, the people of God, to heal us and to walk us through freedom and hope, to grow in our faith and grow in our relationship with Jesus. Do you know that you cannot produce the fruits of the Spirit in your life without others? You just can't do it. You're praying for patience. You need someone in your life to test every bit of them. Right? Like, you're not going to develop long-suffering if you're on your own. You're not going to be able to develop love if there's not anyone to love. You know, you're not going to be able to develop grace if there's no one to send grace to. We need others to grow in the fruits of the Spirit, to grow in the nature of God. So we want you to take a risk and join a community. We are getting ready to smarter, start small groups this fall. They're getting ready. They're on our website. We're going to be talking about more in a couple weeks. We have more groups than we've ever had launching this semester for you to get connected. So there's no excuse, all right? No excuse. So we want you to live in, experience life, live in community. Then be more than that, it's not, just about, it's not just about feeding yourself, but it's about then discovering who God made you to be, discovering your personalities and your spiritual gifts, and, and discover your purpose. Like, what, why have you gave, why am I here? Why do I live? Why am I in this community? Why am I here? God, what have you called me to do? We want to help you discover that. We use that through Growth Track as a vehicle in which we do that. We have a Growth Track starting in, in, in October. You can be part of that. We want to help you discover your purpose, and then ultimately we want to make you make a difference, help you make a difference by serving others. And this is where I believe we find the most fulfillment in life is when we begin to serve others and we, get, we, we go closer to Jesus. You can say it this way, our heart for you, my prayer for you as your pastor is that you give your life to Jesus, you allowed him to be made new by Jesus, you be made new by Jesus, you become like Jesus, and then you just do what Jesus did. Like ultimately, it comes down to this. And you can't do this without knowing Jesus. You have to grow closer to Jesus. These last few years, we've been here just over three and a half years, almost three and a half years, and it's been amazing. I, I don't think there's a better joy and a better job than doing what I do. I am, I am blessed. I, am, I'm exci- I think this is the best church in the world. I think you're the best people in the world. I think Concordant is a hidden gem that I'm, I want people to come, but I don't want people to come. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, you all know what I mean by that? It's like you're... You kind of want people to come because it's nice when we grow as a community, but you're also like, but keep the riffraff away, you know? <laughs> Sorry, that was a little too vulnerable. I don't mean that. <laughs> Everyone come. It's amazing. I love it. But it's been amazing over these last three years of what we've seen God do in the Harbor Church. You know, we, I remember our first gathering post-COVID, you know, those days. I think there's 30 of us in a room. And now we're almost 300 every week. That's why we need two services. Do you know that it's not just about numbers, it's not just about seats in the chair. Do you know that each one of those numbers is a story, it's, it's a name. Do you know that out of those 300, we've seen 25 people give their life to Jesus for the very first time? Yep. Yeah, you can smell. We have seen over 50 people get baptized in water to confessing their faith in Jesus. 
We have seen over 40 people take a step of faith and move them from the seats to begin serving and joining our team. So they're serving on, come on. And because of your faithfulness and because of your generosity, we've given, we've not just given, we've invested over $150,000 in emissions locally, nationally, and globally because of your faithfulness. Like God's doing something great. God is moving and he's doing something great. Great, and that's not even including all the stories that I've heard. Of, of I sit down and I hear stories about people and I hear about the transformational love and the regenerative grace that God has done and is doing in people's lives and their stories and how he's bringing their family to Jesus and strengthening marriages and healing homes and bringing children home. Come on, God is moving among us. And it's, we can't get, ex- we need to get excited about that. My heart prayer is that I would never get tired of hearing God's stories. I would never get tired of hearing stories about God's transformational love and his redemptive mercy. I would never get tired of hearing about homes being restored and children coming home. Like, I would just never get tired. May it never be old. May it never become old. This is how Jesus says it in John 15. He says, it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Right? Right? This is, this is how we glorify God, that we bear much fruit, showing yourselves to me, my disciples. And I've told you this so that my joy may be in you. Jesus' joy, the joy of God, the presence of God may be in you. You may dwell in you that your joy may be complete. And here is just a little tidbit that you can understand is that joy is found in staying close to Jesus and serving others. If you want to be filled with the joy of the Lord, if you want to be filled with something beyond just happiness, something beyond just emotion, You need to be staying close to Jesus and serving others. You will be filled with joy. And I see that in us, and I see that in you, and I'm overwhelmed, and I'm excited, and I just cannot, I just, I'm just so full of gratitude. But can I be honest with you? I have these moments in my quiet time, and when I talk to our team, and I'm, and I, and I, I'm thankful, but I'm not content. And I've been asking this question, is it ever okay to ask for more? Like, is it ever okay to ask for more? Is that always just a greedy approach? Is that always an unhealthy way? Or is there a holiness in that reality that we can ask for more? You know, oftentimes I'm dating myself a little bit, but I remember this, you know, that story, and I don't even remember because I don't think I even watched it, but just this one line of Oliver Twist, you know, head, the headmaster, please, sir, might have some more. That's my English accent. You're welcome. <laughs> please, sir, may have some more. Does that sound right? No, it's not good. Spencer's mom's from England. She's just like staring me down pretty hard right now. (laughs) Fail. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. You know, of course, that's a a good time to ask for more. Or what about the story of Elisha and Elijah? And Elijah was the prophet ahead of Elisha. If you ever want to screw those up, it's like J and S. So it's J comes before S. So Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha goes to Elijah and says, I want double of the portion of your blessing. I want double the portion of your anointing. I want to do double. Like, that's a big, bold ask. He's, he wasn't content with just doing what he did. He wants to do more than what he did. And so we see the outpouring of the Spirit through the boldness of his faith. And he, it, was a, it was a hard thing, he asked, but God blessed his faith for more. We see even in the New Testament where Jesus is on the scene, and he's, and, he, and he's speaking to his disciples before he has ascended into heaven. And he says, truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. Meaning, we are invited to do what Jesus did. But then he says, it's almost the same prayer that Elisha and Elijah did have, but he also said, but you will do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. I mean, that there is something more that we are, that's available to us, that is accessible to us as followers of Jesus in the New Testament church, that we don't just have, we don't, we can't just, we don't just need to be content with what Jesus has done, right? Or we're content with what, we, what he's already done, but we can always continue to lean in for more. This is the inheritance of this, this, we are the inheritance, rather, of this double blessing. And so I've been trying to process this, because I don't want to be un, I don't want to be selfish, and I don't want to be greedy, but I also don't want to be content when I realize that as great as God is moving in our church, there's still so many more people in our community who are still far from him. And as our churches across Concordia and Bruce County continue to grow and continue to be effective, we celebrate that. But no matter how big we get, the church and the community is still so much greater. There's so many more people that we can reach. And so as I was praying and preparing for this Sunday and for this year, I just felt God led me to 2 Kings, the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 4. And we hear this story of Elisha. 
um, Elisha, so the younger servant, Elisha, in his ministry. And I want to kind of, kind of sit in it for a couple minutes and just see if we can glean something from it in this approach to looking for more. It says, in, starting in verse 1, it says, One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, has died, and you know your servant feared the Lord. And now the creditor is coming to take my two children as his slaves. So here is this woman, her husband has passed away. As we understand, as the scripture reveals that she was a man of God. He was a man of God. He feared God. But even though he's now passed away, she's left with two children who aren't at the age yet where they can take care of her. Okay, understanding cultural that women weren't able to work at this time. And so really depended on the fathers or the husbands or the children to take care of the women. And her children, obviously, at this age, are still young enough not to be able to do that. And so she's fearful that they're going to be taken away. There's a, there a sense of desperation in her voice where she's at kind of at wit's end. She doesn't know what else to do. And Elisha looks to her and says, what can I do for you? Which is a pretty funny question. Because here you see this woman who is at loss, and he's like, I just need something. She doesn't even know what to do, but she, he's I just need to do something. I, I wonder if... If Jesus does this, if God does this, because we saw Jesus do this rather in the New Testament, you know, where he, he's talking to people who are blind or who are deaf, and he's like, what can, I, what can I do for you? Is this an obvious thing? But there's something about stirring up our faith to ask for something and to, 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 to speak it into existence, to speak it out and, and into God's ears. Tell me, what do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? What is available to you, she's saying. God, uh, Elisha says to her, what is available to you? To you, And I think this is an important question. I'm reminded about when Moses was in the, in the wilderness and the, form, the burning bush happened and God spoke to Moses and says, what's in your hand? See, a lot of times we overlook the things that God has given us. We overlook the things that we got, that's made available to us. And, and so she looks and she says, I have nothing in my hand except this jar of oil, meaning it's something, a small little jar of oil that doesn't really look like a whole lot. In fact, I didn't even consider it as an option because it probably wasn't sufficient enough. And how often do we overlook these things? And then he said to her, go and borrow some empty containers from your neighbors. So Elisha, what's he do? He gives her vision, gives her vision. Here we, here we see a woman who has no vision. Here we see a woman who's without vision, which means she's leading to death. She seems hopeless. Elisha comes into the situation and he gives her a vision for her life. He gives her a plan. He gives her a goal. And he says, but it needs to be a big vision. He says, don't just get a few. Don't just get a few. I mean, a lot of us were content with just doing the bare minimum. No, don't just get a few. You need to reach out and get more. And then, and then he shut the door behind you and your sons and pour the oil in the containers and set the full ones aside. So the woman heard the vision. She heard the direction. And then she had to put it in to practice. And so I hope you're hearing what I'm saying is that there is, there is a woman here in dire need. She needs more. She has a desire for more. She needs to do something. And here is a vision. The man of God comes into the situation, gives her a vision, and she heard the vision, but then she has to do something with it. Just hearing about it is not enough. She has to apply the vision to her life. I love how Elisha just doesn't do the miracle. He just doesn't provide for her, but he invites her in to the process. He invites her to be part of the miracle process. And as I was reading the story, and I was reading through this this summer as I was preparing, I just felt like this is the language, is that before she was given the provision, she needed to make provisions. Like before she was given the provision, she needed to make provisions. I mean, we all we, we, we say this along here, is that we need to work like it all depends on us, and then we got to pray like it all depends on God. I know a lot of us, a lot of us would just love to provide for us, like just provide, you know? But in here, there's a sense of dependency upon God where God's inviting us to stir up our faith to be a part of the process. And all throughout Scripture, it's interesting, you see this sort of supernatural relationship or this blended relationship between the natural and the supernatural. And what you see all throughout Scripture, and you see it in the story, is that the natural precedes the supernatural. Meaning, we're all here going, hey God, give me a move. God, can you work on our behalf? Can you answer my prayer? We have this move of God. I'm wondering why God isn't moving on our behalf. And I believe God's up there will do something that I can bless. Like if you go through all throughout Scripture, Moses, he had to step into the Red Sea before the Red Sea split. 
You know, the disciples had to offer the, the loaves and fish to disciples before, 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 to Jesus before he multiplied it. You know, someone had to go pour a, a thing of water before Jesus turned it into wine. Like there was an action of faith needed before Jesus provide the supernatural, provided the supernatural provision. You see this all throughout Scripture. It's this blended relationship where Jesus responds to the faith of man. And every move of the Spirit was initiated by faith, the faith of God to walk in obedience. We have humanity's faith to walk in obedience and then trusting God with the outcome. And some of you are like, well, I've never seen God move on my behalf. And I'm just here to tell you, you're in, you're experiencing it today. You're experiencing the move of God. I think some of us, we, we're, we, we miss the supernatural acts of God because we're looking for something spectacular. And you're like, God doesn't provide healing because we've never seen someone's leg grow back. You know, like, sure, that's awesome, but God can heal in other ways. Like, we, we've never seen God's provision in these spectacular moments, but we see God's faithfulness day in and day out. Let's not miss the supernatural by looking too intently for the spectacular. God is moving among his people. We can miss what God is doing by looking too intently for some spectacular event that's, that'll just blow in and blow out. I don't know how many people even would have noticed you know, when you think about 5,000, 4,000 plus people sitting on the hill in the New Testament where Jesus feeds them all and multiplies these loaves and fishes, how many of them even knew that a miracle was actually taking place? How many of them even knew they were experiencing the miracle? You know, we get the benefit of reading the story after the fact. But some of them could have missed it in the moment, but a miracle was taking place, and a miracle is happening. I just want you to know, a miracle is happening in your midst. Don't lose sight. Don't lose sight. And here's Elisha speaking to this young woman, and he invites her into the process to experience the miracle power of God. So as I was processing it, there's four questions that I believe we just need to ask, allow ourselves to ask as we process this and apply Scripture to our life. The first question is, it's an obvious question, is what has God placed in your hands? You know, it may, it may not be a jar of oil, but maybe it's time, or maybe it's talent, or resources, or maybe it's experiences. Whatever, what has God placed in your hand? What has God given to you that is unique to you? And the second question you need to evaluate once you discover that is, what is God asking you to do with it? So as God has given you something, we all have been given something, and what is he asking us to do with that? He's asking us to go. And then here's where the faith comes in. I love, he asked the, the woman to go and borrow. Can you imagine the faith it took for the woman to leave her house feeling desperate and going to her neighbor's house and knocking on the door and asking to borrow a jar? In my mind, again, we don't know the quantity, but in my mind, I would imagine she had a small portion amount of oil, so much so that she didn't even, it was insignificant to her, that it wouldn't provide for her, right? Can you imagine going and borrowing a jar that was bigger than the jar of oil you had? Like, just, just allow yourself to step out of the situation for a moment, because we know the end of the story. But imagine the faith it took for this young woman with her sons to go into her neighbors, to borrow jars that were bigger than the jar of oil, thinking that God is going to fill these jars. Like, think about that faith. And here's the question, what faith does God need to activate in you today? To go, to borrow, to take that step. What faith does he need to stir in you? And then the other thing is, what, what fear does he need to help you overcome? Right? Because they can only imagine there wouldn't fear to say, well, that's enough, or that, 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 you mean, to not go to that person. Or, there's a fear to stop us and hold us back from fully experiencing the blessing of God. I think many of us get stuck because we, 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 we get stuck on the unknown outcome. You know, we're like, we look at our reality and we get stuck because we don't see how, everything, how anything's going to actually work out. And so it paralyzes us from actually taking that very first step. And we get riddled in fear. And I, the African Impala is like a deer that runs through the, you know, the, the hills of the, uh, of the plains of Africa. And this thing can jump 10 feet in the air to a span of 30 feet long. Like this thing is fantastic when it's in full stride. But that, little, that animal can be contained in a zoo at the three-foot wall. Because it will not jump where it doesn't see its feet land. And so it can, it's becomes a prisoner to itself in this little football. And how much does fear do that for us? It's like we just don't see what the outcome, we don't see where, was, where this is going to go. And so we just, we don't have the faith to push through that to trust in God. What is faith? Faith is the ability to trust what we cannot 
see. So as we process through this, we understand that Jesus is inviting us today into this blended relationship of the natural and the supernatural, where we get to merge together and work together. And here's what that looks like. We make the provisions, but God brings the provision. Like we do the work that we can do, but we recognize that the work that we can do is limited, that the, ultimately the supernatural has got to show up where God is going to bring the ultimate provision, right? We can't make it happen. We can't do anything beyond our natural ability, but there is something we can do. What is God asking you to do? What does he put in your hand? What does he put in our hand? And so we see right here this, this faith in action where she left, verse 4. So she left. Again, I think that's the hardest step she took. The very first step of leaving, of leaving her home, she, she had shut the door behind her and her sons, and they kept on bringing containers, and she kept on pouring. And when they were full, she said to her sons, bring me another container. But he replied, there aren't any more. And then the oil stopped. This beautiful, supernatural story of God providing for the needs. She started. And it was all on the other, the other side of her faith to take that first step, to knock on that first door, to make that first ask, and to not give up. To not give up and to trust God with it. So the question I've been asking me is, what does it look like to start? Like, what does starting look like for us as a church? What does starting look like for you when it comes to walking in faith and obedience, when it comes to asking for more, and I believe you're in it this morning. I believe today is in this first step of starting, making room for more, adding a second service. It takes a lot of faith because you never. We had a little huddle this morning. We do our team huddle every Sunday morning. It was a little bit earlier this morning. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of being here early in church. All right, a little earlier this morning, coffee was brewing. It was good, and we're all sitting here. There's about 30 of us in the little huddle as we get ready. Kids ministry, guest services, everybody, worship production. We're all here ready to roll. It was awesome. They're my favorite parts of Sunday, one of my favorite parts of Sunday morning. We get together as a team, and we're like, we don't know who's showing up. But we're here. You know? Because that's what faith does, right? Faith, I don't know what's on the other side of this step. I, I don't know where this is going to go. But we're here. We took a first step. We're here. God's faithful. God's building, God's leading, God's drawing people to himself. We get to be part of it. We get to celebrate with it. I'm excited for what God is doing and what he's going to continue to do. But we're in it. We're adding the extra room. But what does that mean for you? Listen, what does a first step look for you today? Maybe your first step today is just inviting someone to church. Maybe for you it's like I just inviting your neighbor to come and sit with you in church on a Sunday. Like maybe that's the first step. You don't need to lead them to Jesus. You don't need to lead the sinner's prayer. You don't need to know Romans Road. You don't need all that stuff that, you, that maybe, maybe freaks you out. Just invite them to come and sit in church with you on Sunday. Just maybe that's your first step. Or maybe your first step is participating in a small group and just joining community. Like, hey, I've been a part of this church for a long time, and I've always kind of kept, kept a little bit of a distance, but maybe my first step is just sort of saying yes to community and allowing myself to get to know people. Do you know, as our church continues to grow, you're not going to know everybody. But you need to know somebody. And not everyone's going to know you, but somebody needs to know you. And the curse of a large church is that you can come to church and leave and not be missed or seen. And we just, we're just going to push hard against that, as hard as we can. But that's not my responsibility. That's not Pastor Rob's responsibility, Pastor Smith. That's our responsibility, right? And it's also individually my responsibility to step into community, to allow myself to be seen and known and cared for right? So we're going to do that. Maybe that's your first step. Maybe your first step is just begin to serving, serving through your gifts. Maybe you recognize, hey, God's giving you time, talents. He's giving you abilities. And maybe you're like, hey, I've been receiving the ministry, but I want to participate in serving the ministry, joining a team, serving through our groups, uh, through our teams, rather, and joining, serving through Growth Track. I believe that spiritual formation or spiritual growth happens more in your serving than it does in your sitting. All right? Maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you're like, hey, I kind of feel stuck. Begin to serve. Because guess what? It's going to push you in this place where you need to ask questions. Because you're going to feel inadequate. And that's a good thing. Because what that inadequacy does is it moves you back to community, back to crowd, back to the Word of God, to seek out the answers, to seek out direction, to seek out wisdom, which just allows you then to serve again. And you begin to grow. And that's how you grow. That's the invitation of our spiritual formation. And so she started. She started. Where, where do you need to start today? 
Where do you need to take that next step of faith and putting your full weight on God? And then there's this beautiful line, until there was none left, until there was no more left. See, this beautiful part of the story is that God filled whatever was brought and what was, whatever was available. There's no shortage of God's supply. But God is a supply, and he is a source, and he is a supply. And here we see in this story that he was the fulfillment and the full supply, meaning that we don't know how many jars they collected. Like, we don't know. Like, Scripture doesn't give us a number, and I think it's okay, because if he gave us a number, I think we then begin to put limitations on the move of God and what it could look like. There's no limitation. There's no, he was a supply. So what we do know, we do know that they gathered enough, right? There was enough to, to, to pay off the debtors and enough for her to live on. But we also know that the oil probably would have kept on pouring if there were more. Right? Like there was enough, but there, there was room for more. And I think this is what it is. When we come to God, and what we come with, open hands, open hearts, you say, God, I know you can fill me, but I know you can fill more. There's more in you to give. There's more in you. As long as I come ready, prepared to receive from you, there is more that you can do. 22 years ago, Pastor Rob and I started a Bible college out in British Columbia. A lot, we're, I'm not that old, but he is. Uh, we started school out there, and uh, I remember walking up the, the Robinson dorm. It's no longer there anymore because it was horrible. But they, they, I walked up, and on the back of the, the one door was this piece of paper that looked like it had been there a long time. And it, from, it was this quote, and I'll never, I, it, it said unknown. I don't know who said it. Maybe someone wrote it in the dorm. I don't even know. But it said, isn't it amazing that we can serve a God who can do what he wants, when he wants, however he wants, and yet he chooses to limit himself to our prayers? And I remember reading that as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old going to college for the first time and realizing there's a, level, there's a level of ability that God has that I need to get my head wrapped around. That God has a level of ability and supply that I often limit because of my faith, my lack of faith. And what would it be like for us, like the woman, to stir up enough faith to go knock on doors and ask for more jars, and ask for more jars, and not get content with the one or the two, be thankful for what God has given us, but not be content, but say, is there more jars? Is there more jars? Because there's more jars as we present to him, the Spirit of God will fill. He will fill. And so is it ever wrong to ask for more? I don't know. In this context, I don't think there was. I don't think it was ever wrong for the woman, of God, the woman to start asking for more jars. I think it was just like, ask for as many as you can find. And here we see the end of the story in verse 7. And so she went to the man of God and she said, go. Um, she went and told the man of God that everything is full. And he said to her, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. So your sons and you can live on the rest. So here we see that the benefit of the oil, the benefit of the blessing, wasn't just, wasn't just for them, but it was for others. That there's a benefit of the blessing wasn't just for them to hoard, but it was them to pay off some debts. It was them to take care of the needs of others that, are, that have taken care of their needs. There's something about the overflow effect that when we receive the blessings of God, it not only fills us and not only takes care of our needs, but it also takes care of those needs around us. So we become vehicles of the overflow. Do you know the overflow has nothing to do with the, with the, 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 the jar? Like the jar is just a, is a vehicle. The substance of the overflow is what really what counts. And you cannot overflow what we aren't already filled with. And so my prayer for us is that we be filled to overflow. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more that we give to Jesus, he fills us to overflowing. And here is the thought that as we're leaning into this week or this year, that when we walk in obedience, God works out the outcome. Like when we walk in obedience, we might not know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what next year holds. You know, if you told me three years ago that we'd be at two services already, I don't think I'd believe you. But God is moving. When we walk in obedience and we do what God has called us to do, as simple or silly or seemingly insignificant as it may be, God works through the outcome. And I think that's true for you too. I think that's true for your life. I think it's true for your faith. As God speaks to you, and he asks you to do something, to go somewhere, to say something, to give something, 
to pray for someone, whatever that leading of the Spirit is in your life, the nudging of the Spirit, when you walk in obedience, something happens in the outcome. And He moves through you divinely that you may have never experienced before. It's our prayer. We pray this as our benediction. We pray this as our, our blessing that the God of hope would fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. Right? This is the obedient part. As you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, is it ever wrong to ask for more? Here's, here's, where I, here's my conclusion to that question. When it comes to possessions, let's learn the secret of contentment. That's what Paul tells us, right? When it comes to possessions, let's learn the secret of contentment. Let's be content with what God has given us. But when it comes to people, let's adopt a holy discontentment. When it comes to people, when it comes to those who are far from God, when it comes to making room for others and inviting other people into community and leading people to the foot of the cross, when it comes to people, let's never be content with what we've got. I sit with the pastors in our town once a month and we pray for our, one another, we encourage one another on, and, and as well as these churches are growing, it's just, we're, still, we're still scratching the surface in our community. And I'm celebrating with them, we pray with them, we recognize that we're not the only church in our community, we're a church in our community, we're part of the, the global church, the, the church of God in our community. And I'm not just praying for more in our community, I'm praying for more in those churches. I'm praying for more in every Bible-believing, Jesus-centered Christian church in our community that they would receive more that they would see people come into saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That it's actually okay to be discontent. We can actually have a holy discontentment and seek out for more. Why? Because the Lord is not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone, someone say everyone, everyone to come into repentance. Do you know that everyone means everyone? It means the people you like, you don't like. It means the people that can benefit you, you know, relationally. It means the people that take away from you, take a lot. It means the people you think that don't deserve God's grace. All those people. God's grace is sufficient for everyone to come into repentance. So what can we do? What's our steps? There's a lot we can do, but I'm just talking about starting. Where do we start? Maybe starting for you today looks like just getting connected. Maybe even come in and you've just been on that fringe and you just haven't really got connected with anybody. Maybe today's the day, the first step is just get connected. Taking that connect card, seat in front of you, filling that out, bring it back to the welcome center, saying, I just wanna, I'm just gonna extend a hand. I just wanna get connected. I just want somebody to know me. I don't wanna just be in and out, I wanna be seen and known. Maybe that's your first step. Maybe you need to come and join our welcome lunch we have next month. And just say, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get connected. I wanna get to be known. I wanna know people. That's his first step, that's a great first step. Or maybe you're here like, just take another step. Maybe you're like, hey, I need to take a step by participating in groups or serving others. And I need to get connected in a small group or get, go through growth track. I just need to take a step. I've been, I'm coming. I know people, but I'm not really involved. I'm just sort of, you know, I need to get in connected. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe you can help us by spreading the word. Maybe your, your next step is by sending the invitation. You know that you get to take Jesus to people when you leave today. And then you can bring Jesus, people to Jesus by inviting them to church on Sunday. You get this beautiful opportunity where you can help just spread the word. Be, the, be a voice of the gospel of grace. Or you can join us in prayer. Join us in prayer every Tuesday morning from 8 to 9. It used to be 7 to 8. But we heard the people. Now we're going 8 to 9. Jesus still moves at that hour. Every Tuesday morning, 8 to 9, we're here praying. Believe it. We're going to pray like it all depends on God. Because it does. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're just going to believe for more. Maybe that's the step that you can take. It's just, I'm just trying to believe him for more. I'm going to stir up my faith to believe that all things are possible. That God can use a little town, a little church like the harbor, in a little town like in Cardin to actually make a global, national impact. We can actually become the sending place that makes a difference. And the ripple that starts here as it spreads out through Bruce County and through Ontario and through Canada. That we can actually make an impact for the glory of God. We can believe that God wants to do greater things in us and through us than we've even thought for ourselves if we continue to give him more opportunity and more of us. So here's what we're gonna do. What are we doing? We're gonna make the provisions. And we're gonna trust God with the provision. We're gonna walk in obedience and we're gonna trust God with the outcome. What step do you need to take today? What step is God asking you to take as you
you trust him for more. Why don't you stand to your feet? I just believe that this is, we are just standing on the cusp of what God wants to do. I, I'm so thankful for what he has done. And we'll continue to celebrate what he has done. But with a holy discontentment, we're looking towards the future and saying, God, thank you, but we're ready for more. Thank you, but we want more. And so if you're here, welcome. You're part of the team. We're inviting you to the team as we continue to grow together. Just a couple reminders. This Wednesday night, we have our Mark launch, our Mark student launch, grades se uh, 7 to 12. That's happening Wednesday night, so be part of that. If you're here and you want prayer, we have a ministry team that will pray for you and bless you before you leave. Also, I want to invite you to stay after service as we come and have barbecue and have fun out there and just enjoy community one with another. And the next step is come back next Sunday, 9 or 11, and bring a friend with you. And let's let the glory of God prevail in our lives. Amen? Amen. The band's going to lead us in song as our blessing before we leave. But I'm so thankful for you, and I pray God's richest blessing on you as you continue to grow into an overflowing relationship with Jesus. God bless. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us, everybody. There's a barbecue at the